Thanks, guys. So, um, so this is a different different lane for me. Um, I, a little bit of backstory because it's kind of a weird, fun backstory of why I did Epic Fantasy. The story, the basic story, is this: when I was a kid, the very first book I ever bought with my own money was a Lancer edition of Conan the Wanderer, 1968. Uh, Robert E. Howard's some of his stories, and then some stuff by uh, Elspeth de Camp and, and Lynn Carter. And it was, the, I mean, the very first book I ever bought. So it, 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 it meant a lot to me. Plus, I fell in love with epic fantasy, and I read all of the, the other epic fantasy writers who were out at the time, Michael Moorcock and, and uh, Fritz Liebers, Faffer the Gray Mauser, C.L. Moores, Jarrell Joyry, all of those guys, reading them all. Um, but I, I never actually thought I was going to write that, which is odd. So that's part one of the story. The second part of the story is um, some of you have already heard how I met Ray Bradbury and Richard Matheson. Um, the, the librarian for my middle school when I was 12 was the secretary for two different clubs of professional writers. One that met in New York, and that was the Bradbury Matheson crowd. But the one that met in Philly, where I lived, was called the Hyborian Legion. It was a group of epic fantasy writers. Back then, it was called Sword and Sorcery. Sprague de Camp was one of the founding members and was there all the time. He eventually became a kind of um, like mentor and friend all the way up until, you know, just about when he died. He was a great guy was over his house in Villanova a lot. And I remember standing in his office, which was lined with bookshelves of his books and all the foreign editions of it and different versions of it. And it was, I was standing there like, I want that one of these days. And uh, weirdly, I actually have that now, which I still find freakish. Um, but jump forward some years later, and when I met Sarah, uh, one of the one of the early times we, we, you know, we, were, we were sitting in my house uh, looking through photo albums, and I was flipping through photos, and she said, she pointed once, why are you standing there with Uncle Spray? Now, I thought for a split second that it was her actual uncle. It turned out it was just kind of like a family friend. Her grandfather's like one of his best friends. Her grandfather, and this is where the story gets weird and twisted, her, her grandfather was a, a, a Pulp Fiction writer, Pulp Fiction editor, anthologist, but also a, the junior partner of the Otis Klein Literary Agency who represented Robert E. Howard, Ray Bradbury, and all these folks. And almost everyone who wrote for Weird Tales were clients of their um, agency. Roll forward to, I don't know, four years ago, a couple of friends of mine, uh, a friend of mine called me and said, hey, they're restarting Weird Tales. Do you want to edit it? You know, so it just it feels like one of those sitcom things where there's all these weird coincidences, but it's my life. And um, when, uh, when her father died, her, her grandfather died in 63, or when her father died, the, there were boxes, file boxes from that agency in, in his attic. Or, or, and um, I think they were going to throw them out, but you or, they didn't know what to do with them anyway. And she saw some of the names in the files and said, oh, Jonathan would like that. And now I have them. In those papers is, among other things, two really important things, other than all the contracts and their correspondence with Isaac Asimov and everything else, which is insane. The original typescript manuscript of People of the Black Circle by Robert E. Howard and the original TypeScript manuscript of Cool Air by H.P. Lovecraft. And I'm, I'm, when, I, when I found these things, it was like, imagine a junkie finding a mountain of crack. That's what it felt like. And I'm like, oh, yes. you know. And I, I, every time I think of it, it gets freakier and freakier. Um, so a little over, I guess about a year and a half ago, not even two years ago, my editor at, at uh, St. Martin's, uh, St. Martin's Griffin, Division of Macmillan, <clears throat> called me out of the blue and said, we just had a meeting and we're all talking about how, you know, our imprint would love to do some epic fantasy. Do you have any interest? And I was trained long ago to say yes first and then figure it out. So I said, sure. And he said, well, pitch me something. And we'll see if it works. I had to pitch to him in 20 minutes. And by the end of that day, we had a deal in place. My agent took it. They, they made a deal for two books in this new series, Cake in the Damned. Um, 
I had more fun writing that than anything I have ever written. Joe Ledger, Inc., all the stuff I love doing, Black Panther. I had more fun doing this. And people tell me that it shows because, I mean, and mind you, it's not like fun, happy, I'm giving wonderful characters a lovely week. Um, it's dark and weird and, and bad things happen to a lot of people. Um, but I had fun doing it. And I just you know, recently finished the second book, Son of the Poison Rose, which will be out in January. And uh, yesterday we made the deal for the third book. So I will be continuing the series. Thank you. Um, for Joe Ledger fans, uh, in that same deal, we also sold books 14 and 15 in the Joe Ledger series. Um, and that was supposed to be a standalone novel. I, I had the idea for one book, gave it to my agent, said, oh, this is cool. I can probably sell this. Took it to that agency or that, that, that publisher. And the deal was um, for that and it's two, and two sequels. And she said, any chance you have more ideas? Uh, because the editor wants to talk to you about what the sequels are. And I said, when's he going to call? She said, a any, and then my phone rang. Um, so I'm on the phone with the guy, and he says, well, what's, what are the next two books about? And I completely pulled them out of my ass. You know, um, I said, well, this one's about this, and this one's about this. And uh, I, you know, I don't even remember what the hell I told him on the phone. You know, um, And the deal was made. And now I'm about to start book 13, and we just sold 14 and 15. And it's because of, of Patient Zero, that standalone book, that I met this sketchy character. Yes. So why don't you tell them how, how that happened? Um, I woke up, uh, I had been drugged. I was in the back of a van someplace. And um, the other version. Sorry. I looked out the window and saw a sign saying, now under the King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. And I said, <laughs> Wait, why am I here? We stopped in Doylestown. They dumped me out on the street. And uh, this manuscript was thrown at me from the dark and said, finish it, or, you know, held up a picture of my cat at the time. He gets it. So I ran home and recorded it. I thought we were supposed to tell the fake version of the story. Right, sorry. Um, so, yeah, so I was working, uh, I, I had basically, not too long before, I just started narrating audiobooks, and I was at Blackstone Audio, uh, when it was just Blackstone Audio, in Ashland, Oregon, and they came to me with this book, and they were like, uh, the guy, Grover Gardner, who is, who I credit with me having a career, he's really like the, the father of my audio book career. We uh, have uh, this book, and I'm not sure it's like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's uh, pretty accurate. It's zombies, but it's kind of also like military thriller, like, uh, what's his name? Tom Clancy. Tom Clancy. It's like Tom Clancy, but with zombies. And I'm like, great. <laughs> um, I had no idea. And then I did the book. And, I mean, we started recording and I was in chapter one. I was like, <laughs> he talks like me. And um, Basically, smart ass and yeah, anti establishment. Yeah. And a mess inside. You know, yeah. So it was, uh, so it was kind of tailor made. And then. After the book came out, uh, it was the very first time that I had heard from an author. Uh, and Jonathan reached out to me and was like, you know, I really like what you did with it. And I was like, oh, you know. Um, and then there was another one, and then there was another one, and then there was another one. And I've actually lost count of how many books we've done. We've done a lot. Yeah. And I'd like to continue losing count, please. Well, um, I, I, he's now in my contracts that they have to offer it to him first. Um, um, which is great. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. I'm fairly happy about it, too. You know, I was, uh, I was telling uh, some Peter that you two um, have very much to do with uh, the fact that I was able to establish myself at the time that I did. Because 14 and Patient Zero happened pretty close to each other. Yeah. Um, and that kind of put me on the map as a narrator. And I was able to continue the work. And because I was able to continue the work, um, when I was over in England and they were Justice League, Zack Snyder heard the rumor that I married audiobooks, he likes to have the scripts read to him. I read them to him. One day he showed me a picture and said, what does this guy sound like? I did it. Didn't hear anything at all. Didn't think anything of it. Two weeks later, they were like, you're dark side. So you guys have a whole lot to do with me being dark side. So thank you. Thank you. And royalty check is much appreciated. Yeah, no worries. Get that, get that right to you. He actually 
uh, can you hold that that thing up? You have. He actually brought Peter and I Funko Pops of Dark Side. Yeah, because that's just badass. That, Back and, in the day when I was working at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, a bunch of us actors were sitting around talking about, you know, well, what do you want to do? What do you? People were like, I'd like to be in a Merchant Ivory movie because they were really hot at the time. And, uh, you know, people were like, oh, I want to work at the RSC or I'd like to go to Broadway. And me and another friend of mine, Jonathan, uh, were basically like, we want action figures. That's the goal. So it's cool. My work here is cool. My work here is cool. Yeah, I get to do, I get to do uh, these books, and it's wonderful. Because I am now a massive fan. Um, As I am. And I'm always really, really excited. So you, and starting this was like, okay, this is Terra and Pitmuda. It's a whole new thing. And yet it was still very comfortable. And it's still your writing. So I was able to just like lay back and let the book drop. Uh, did, did you do a cold read on this one? Like you do on the other? Yes. Jesus that, that drives me nuts. He doesn't pre-read the books. He just narrates them. And yeah. I can't do that if I'm going to do a reading of my own stuff. You know, I've got to rehearse. Oh, I'm going to be a mess tonight. Yeah. Because yeah. wow. I read it before. Okay. Um, and he's going to do a reading in just a minute or two. So about Kagan, for those who have not yet read the book, here, here's, here's the setup of it. It is set 50,000 years from now. It is Earth. But everything about our world is it collapsed down and was completely eradicated Humanity reverted to barbarism. It was a slow climb back up. So they don't remember anything about our world. The co- there's, there's been massive, uh, uh, and, you know, catastrophic earth changes, you know, that have happened. So even the map, which I love the book with the map, not in the audio version, but it's in the book. Uh, the map doesn't really resemble the earth that we know it, which is fine. Um, the only part of our world that, is, that still exists, and it's only hinted out in book one, are relics frozen in giant glaciers, and uh, that will that will play a little more into book two and very much in book three. The things that are found in there. Um, a lot of people ask me if there are crossovers with Joe Ledger because he shows up in a lot of other stuff. The only crossover with Joe Ledger is in the second book, and it's not a spoiler because I have mentioned this plenty of times online. The character Nicodemus shows up in the second book, known as the Prince of Games. But no one else, no Mr. Church, none, nothing else, Nicodemus. Um, I may, since the next Joe Ledger book deals with a lot of um, psychotic splits and and uh, people tripping on hallucinogenic drugs, I'm actually thinking of ha- having a, a, a Kagan scene in Joe's flash flashbacks. I don't know. i gotta, I got to see if my editor you know, threatens to kill me if I do that. He has threatened bodily harm a few times. Though, he is directly responsible for something that is in Kagan. I'll explain. My editor, Michael Homler, tends to go to, uh, he's in, he's in uh, Connecticut, but he flies out to Comic-Con every year. And we walk around Comic-Con, because we're both nerds, and we talk, and every year he asks me, well, what's the next Ledger book going to be? doesn't matter what I've pitched. What I write never matches what i pitched. I mean, I think we established that earlier. And as a joke one day, I say, Joe Ledger meets Cthulhu. And, he, and I'm expecting him to go, huh, no. And he goes, that's awesome. <laughs> and I had no real intention of doing this, mind you. So I, I, that was the book Kill Switch, in which Joe Ledger, in fact, does encounter Cthulhu. And if you don't know who Cthulhu is, H.P. Lovecraft created this myth- mythology of these elder gods that came to Earth and, and so on. Um, and every, he allowed anyone else who wanted to write in that mythos to do so. You know, it, it was a, one of the very first possibly the first shared world in fiction. And um, so because that that was so successful in the, in the Ledger books, I wound up, you know, writing more Cthulhu short stories. And then, of course, I became the editor of Weird Tales, where the Cthulhu stories were first published. So I figured it, it just, I feel like it's a moral imperative. Anybody know what that line is from? No? Real genius. Thank you. Real genius. Moral imperative. You, you, you get you get a, a, a prize. Real genius. So cool. um, but uh, so I, I figured I had to put Cthulhu and so in in, um, in the Kagan book, but not necessarily as the bad guy. So I, I play. I had some fun with that. I had some fun with with uh, folklore too, because there's a character in there who is actually based on three different poems that I love so much that are also inspired by folklore. Uh, John Keats, um, uh, Love of Them, Sounds Merci. Um, Alfred Tennyson's uh, The Lady of Shalott and Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen. 
all three of those characters combined into one in the book. So there's a lot of, if you're really deep book nerd like I am, there are a lot of little Easter eggs. And if you're not, the story can stand on its own, which is part of what you want to do when you're a writer is to not make it exclusive only to a certain crowd, but to offer fun little Easter eggs for those who can find them. So I had a lot of fun. Almost anything else I would say would be a spoiler. What I'm going to do is turn it over to Ray. Now, the, there are a lot of different things that he could read, but there's a lot of spoilers in, in some. Yes. There's one chapter where, and this is not a spoiler because it's first page of the book, this empire, the Silver Empire, is, is overrun in the first page, pretty much. That, that's how the book starts. Not a spoiler to, to know that's happening. So I did one little chapter of little vignettes of when this is happening and magic after a thousand years of being uh, forced out of the world is beginning to return and how that affects different characters. Some of these characters are only in vi these little vignettes. So he's going to read a couple yeah. pages of that. Um, can you guys hear me okay? okay. Chapter 13. There are certain moments in which the entire world pauses to gasp in wonder, to cry in pain, to speak a fervent prayer, to make a sign against some unseen evil. It is rarely a thing known clearly in the minds of those who take that moment to react. People become suddenly aware that something has happened, but they do not yet know what that thing is or what it will mean. All they know is that the world has changed. Something about it has changed. In a high room in a slender tower embowered by walls draped in ancient ivy and surrounded by flowers, a woman rose suddenly from her loom and walked to the window. She looked out at the night sky, at the diamonds glittering above the distant waves. That woman, who had seen so much over her years, felt that change. She was dressed in a shift of pale silk, but the cloth was nearly completely obscured by moss and lichen, ivy and climbing vines from which live flowers had long ago bloomed. For uncounted years, those flowers had been withered and dry, the leaves gray with dust. Now, a single flower bloomed on a long dead vine, a rose as black as all the sorrow in the world and one whose petals peeled back to reveal a spot of red on each, red as blood. She touched long fingers to a talisman she wore on a silver chain. The pendant was a crow fashioned from obsidian, whose eyes were made from tiny emerald chips. The woman touched the crow and murmured a prayer in a language so old that no one alive save she even knew of the lost people who spoke it. In the trees outside, a thousand crows raised their rusty voices and cried out in fear. In the nation of Vulconia, hard against the vast cathedral mountains, gateway to the east, King Hesket sat up suddenly in bed, his trembling fingers clutching at his chest. For a terrible moment, he thought that this was his end, his doom to die after a hundred campaigns and a thousand battles in bed, victim of a fragile heart. But the pain, vicious as it was, lasted but a moment and then it passed, leaving him sweating and frightened. His bedroom was quiet and his wife slept on, though she stirred and groaned in her sleep. He watched her and knew that she too was in pain but too far down in her dream to let it wake her. The king rose and crossed to the door. He opened it softly so as not to wake the queen. Guards snapped to attention, but he calmed them with a gesture. Is all well? demanded the king. Everything is quiet, your majesty, said the sergeant. The king studied his face for a moment and then nodded and retreated, closing the door. He did not immediately return to the warmth of his bed, and instead stood in his nightshirt, his hand lingering on his chest over his fluttering heart. 
dots of the pit protect us, he murmured, though he did not know from what threat he sought intervention. In Pharos, a small nation thousands of miles away on the eastern side of the continent, a priest of the faith of Hastur, the shepherd god, looked up from a scroll he'd been reading. The scroll was the eighth of twenty-seven brought to him from the icy wastelands of the winter wilds, the glacier that rose from the frozen sea. The priest was in his tenth week of a difficult and painstaking translation of an account of a great war between brother gods who came to earth millions of years ago and who now slept and dreamed in cities lost beneath the waves. The priest had just completed translating a key phrase it was, he discovered, both a prayer and a prophecy. And though some of the words had no direct corollary in Ferozian, he felt that his translation was close enough. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. He had absently mouthed the words once the prayer was translated, and immediately a deep chill swept through him. For a moment it was as if he sat naked on the banks of the frozen sea, with a stiff wind blowing toward him from the great mountains of ancient ice. The priest stood up, and even stepped back from his desk, drawing a warding sign in the air, and then touching the sacred tattoos inked on his skin. He hurried to the window and looked out, but the night was calm. A lazy moon peered out from behind coasting clouds. The only sound was the soft exhalation as the ocean breathed waves onto the sand and then inhaled them again. This priest has risen, he said aloud and nearly jumped out of his skin when he realized that the words had come unbidden. One more quick question. There's no way that I'm going to On the island nation of Styria, across the 800 miles of the Golden Sea, a scholar falls on the parapet of a city that had been abandoned more than 3,000 years ago. The rest of his team, students and diverse colleagues and scribes, slept deeply after a long day spent excavating the money of a child who would have been a great king. The wrappings have been carefully removed, revealing a small slit in the flesh of the child's back beneath one shoulder. The child has been murdered. That much is clear, but why and by whom? I never did know. The scholar had learned to please, making notes about their day's fire on a fresh sheet of parchment, recording each minute detail of this old script. The sound had disturbed him. I thought it was the sound of small feet running through the walls of that place, and the high, sweet laughter of the child. The laugh fell from the air, and after the 
Beyond that dark expanse was his home, the tiny nation of dead, tucked between the much larger countries of Samud, Leonite, and Haki. He had been four years on this island, but though he loved his work long enough to go home, two deep boats. His father looked out across the golden sea, his family far away. The echo You gotta consider doing this for a living. You know, I've been looking into it. It's just tough to get a gig. Um, you know, it's funny. I've mentioned this at, at some signings, and some of you have heard me say this. Uh, others have not. I, he's done so many of my books. I actually hear his voice in my head when I know he's going to be recording my books as I'm writing, and it's it's so, somewhere between really cool and useful and kind of weird and freaky. It makes my job a lot easier. Yeah. And I do try to trip him up, like the language that he was speaking, that strange language. Uh, for those who have ever read the Lovecraft books, that is the Lovecraft uh, language, the language of Cthulhu. Um, and there is online, just like they have, you know, English to French translate, there's an English to Relay translator. Translates to that language. I uh, used it a lot. as Because as, I mostly want to mess with him. Yes. Um, you know, I, I've... Because every time I think I'm messing with him, you know, he wins. Like the time I, I had a character speaking Lakota Sioux, and it turned out he had learned Lakota Sioux for a, a, a theater project. Nobody speaks Lakota Sioux anymore, you know? Um, Some of the people in South Dakota might make But the thing is, when I called the, the, the tribal council to get translation, yeah. they had to go get someone. Yeah. Because yeah. they didn't speak enough of the language. Yeah. And this fellow <laughs> wasn't the word that was coming out i remember we're on camera now um sp spoke so so um i think that the most I, the, the most i've been able to really get you though was was the most recent joe ledger book relentless because i have the, him bouncing around from country to country to country and i made sure that that there are people speaking in those languages because i knew he does cold reads and i could just imagine you know it's some a real some, thing yeah this, this is a real thing and i know i'm like Code red, code red. Yeah, well, um, but you know, if you can't have a little fun, no, it's really, I mean, it's very fun. It's like, you know, it'd be like a paramedic writing notes to the nurses on someone's body. <laughs> yeah, like, do you like me? Circle, yes or no. <laughs> you know, I've got to put that in the book now. It's got to happen. Yeah, um, and like when I, I hear the character of Mr. Church, I, I hear his version of it, which was not my original version. I now, wasn't mine either. I have no idea what happened. His voice just came out. Well, there it is. What can I say? But now yeah. it's the voice I hear. And it actually does inform the way I write dialogue for those characters. Um, you know, Church has a, a, a slightly slower and more um, like studied voice. Not as impressed. Not as impressed, you know. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. And I can't I wait was, to... I was telling you over dinner that one of the characters in this book just the way, and I said the music of what you wrote, when I played the music, it was an Irish accent. Yeah. So, yeah. The character Philia, who is, you know, uh, one of the, the heroes of the story. Um, Kagan is, 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 some people want to label it as grimdark, which is a, a, a kind of epic fantasy that is very dark and very downbeat. And it is pretty downbeat at times, but it is not completely without hope. So I don't label myself as fully a grimdark writer, though I have a foot there. Um, even at my darkest, there is usually a thread of hope in my stories. And that's that was challenging to write when so many things are going bad in this story. And the hero spends a lot of the early part of the book drunk and in despair, uh, which I, you know, I'm reading listening to those chapters now in audio and I'm having a lot of fun with the way you write him as a drunkard. Uh, right where you read him as a drunkard, but, um, 
but uh, it, it, I, I love I loved writing this book. The second book, Son of the Poison Rose, comes out in January. It's actually longer, um, and it has, like I said, it has Nicodemus in it, which is fun, though. He's called the Prince of Games, and it has some of my favorite characters that I've done in there, including two of the hero's brothers who are basically, if you can imagine, the Weasley twins from Harry Potter, grown up to become dangerous fighters, but still smart asses. That's them. So I had too much fun writing this book. Um, I have people already quoting the character Took and the way he curses. <laughs> he has a very inventive way of, of, yes, of cursing. And I've had people actually say that, those lines back to me on, nice. online, which I, 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 I am touched by that. You know, form of even though they're obscene. Um, so, so anyway, uh, I'm going to open it up to questions because uh, we have... Uh, about 20 minutes or so. Um, and I'd like to, any questions you have, whether it be Kagan or anything else, yes, hit me. He's a pesky scientist, by the way. Um, he's actually, Ronald here is, is uh, the guy I'm tapping for science information for my most recent ledger and other books. And if you read, if you listen to the audio book, uh, the audio story, um, the, the werewolf's 15 minutes. The the scientist that is torn apart by the werewolf at the end is only hurt the ones you love, man. But but yes. Um, I I want everything to have an interior logic to it. So even the magic has its limitations. Like um, we f we find out that you know. Uh, the Witch King, who is his most powerful wizard of the age, has his limits, and all the characters have their limits, and that's that's fun to write because if you create characters that are too powerful, then it takes it robs the story of a lot of dramatic tension. That's why I've never been a fan of Superman stories because he's so powerful you can't hurt him. Uh, that's why so many writers have found ways to weaken Superman. When they did the radio shows, they invented kryptonite for the Superman radio shows because he was just simply invincible, and you wanted you know that. You know, so I try to build into my stories logic as much as possible. Uh, everything has, um, like I said, that, that logical flow to it, but also creating a new form of magic while also borrowing magic styles from different cultures around the world. It isn't one type of magic in the story. Magic is returning in its many forms, including um, some of the, the fairy folk are, are coming back, and they've been gone for many, many thousands of years they have their own kind of magic. There's vampire magic. There's all sorts of kinds of magic in the story. And it's it's so much fun to write that and to write both their limitations and the unique ways in which they're used. Um, the area in which I, I did the most direct science, though, um, is based on my own expertise, which is martial arts. I've been doing martial arts for a very long time. And so the fighting style that Kagan has, which actually he was taught by his mother. His mother was the most... Of, dangerous fighter in the world prior to um, Kagan taking over. She, a lot of people died at the beginning of the book. Again, not a spoiler. You know this happening. Um, she was known as the Poison Rose. And on the cover you see a dagger and roses. Um, she you know, has this unique double knife fighting style with poison blades. And the knives are not really the slender daggers that are on the cover. They're really closer to the Roman short sword. Uh, strong enough to be able to block a sword if done right. Um, but it allows the fighter, Kagan, to be an in-fighter rather than a long-distance fighter. And this is something, for those who know anything about traditional sword play, a, if, if a guy with a sword is fighting multiple opponents, he's probably going to lose, unless they're incompetent. Because it takes a long time to swing and recover the sword. Unlike, say, the Japanese sword, the katana, where the cuts are slices, not chops. So you don't have that... that commitment of weight to it. So in this, he's a he's a, a short, you know, short knife fighter and he gets in close. So I was able to create a fighting style for him that's unique to this character, but makes logical sense. Somebody of his size, weight, and age with those kinds of weapons would be able to fight this way if he was properly trained. And that to me is fun. That's its own kind of science. And we have other characters who fight in, in other ways in the story and, and in the future books. And that becomes a lot of fun. So great great question. What other questions got? Dennis? Mm. 
Well, let me, let me answer that part first. Uh, no, it didn't. It actually excited me because I read poetry every morning. Um, I sometimes read it aloud, sometimes just, just lay in bed reading it or reading it quietly because poetry, um, I've, and I've always done this, po poetry informs the way I write prose because in the brevity with which a poet can take a complex emotional image or visual image and distill it down to a few words in a sentence is beautiful. I try to infuse my, my prose with the kind of figurative language, and descriptive language based on poetry. But in epic fantasy, it lends itself more to that poetic voice, especially the, my favorite group of poets, which are the Pre-Raphaelites from the late 19th century, um, because they based a lot of their poems on uh, Shakespeare, mythology, and, and uh, uh, folk tales. So that type of poetry informs uh, the way in which just word choices, description choices, and so on. Like that scene he was he was reading uh, where the, uh, the the one guy was looking out at the ocean and seeing you know the, 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 the moonlight come across the ocean, or actually it was Marilina who was looking at that tower. All of that is based on, on uh, inspired by poetic voice. It actually felt freeing to step out of the, you know, the voice of Joe Ledger, the voice of Dead of Night, the voice of any of the other series and allow a new voice to emerge that is much more definitely and completely in, in, in influenced by poetry. So, any question for Ray? Yes. Still excited about it. Yeah. Well, every book has a voice. I mean, honestly, half the narrator's game is learning how to listen to what the book is saying. Um, and, you know, my job, as I've said, at Nazi, is just to get the hell out of the way of the text. Um, so if I listen, really, really listen to what the book's voice is, I'm fine. Um, this one, from the jump, I was like, oh, well, this is very different, isn't it? You know, and it was really exciting and really fun. There were enough familiar things that I know that I take great comfort in when I'm narrating one of Jonathan's books that I was able to grab onto as I was going through it. But it was an incredibly pleasant journey. And I found myself getting even more excited as I was nearing the end of the book. I mean, obviously, it was like, damn, I don't want to end. But just because of, it's, you know, it's, as someone I'm very fond of says, it's different gravy. You know, it truly is. This book has its own voice, too. And it forced me to address the book differently when I was married. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, because when I, when I was listening to it, I'm actually now listening to the, the audiobook, um, and it is not the same voice you normally use. Um, and it, it's fun for me to discover that process by listening to your works, because when I... A lot of writers do not listen to their own audiobooks. I actually always do. Partly because I'm an audiobook fan, I love listening to them, and partly I want to hear what my final edited voice is—the the voice that is in print as opposed to the voice of the first draft I wrote. Because most writers are more familiar with the version when you're sitting down to write something than you are with the version of it that the public reads. And by hearing the audio, and with audio you can't skip, you can't skim, you hear the whole thing every word. I'm able to to learn more about my own writing style every time I listen to an audiobook. And, you know, I've had other audiobook readers for different projects. There is a reason I go back to write. Um, there are some audiobook readers, no matter what they read, it sounds like the same voice reading the book. And that gets old real fast. Or they, they don't take the time to, if they don't know how to pronounce a word, to look it up. Um, I had one book where somebody was pronouncing all the Japanese words wrong. And it really pissed me off because I do Japanese martial arts. And, it, you know, I've heard from friends of mine who do Japanese martial arts, and they're like, you know, that's not how it's pronounced. Yes, I know that's not how it's pronounced. Um, he doesn't make that mistake. So, I wouldn't care. right. Well, the thing is that, that the conscientious part of it, the actor's integrity, is not always there in audiobooks. And it's, it's there in our partnership. And I, I really, I'm, really appreciate it. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for that. It's, you know, my, my loyalty is, you know, like I've said before, I'm delivering a letter to whoever's listening to the book. Maybe a little more to it than that, right? Well, okay, so FedEx. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, but seriously, my whole attitude is about honestly to serve the book, serve the author, and serve the person listening to it. Um, 
so I'm, I'm taking care of the book, but I'm also taking care of the author and taking care of the person who's got the 90 minute commute in the morning and decides to spend their money listening to this audio. Um, I'm not real interested in like, pick me, you know, uh, and that's, that's why I think why each book sounds different because I'm just giving voice to different voices. Yeah. You know, so like a Peter Klein's book, it's going to have a very different voice, obviously. Um, so, and that's what's fun about my very silly job. So it works for me. You have a question? Uh, well, right now, there, the publisher wants the Witch King cycle, which is what she's calling it now as of yesterday, to be three books. Uh, I had plotted it out for four, but three is really easy for me to do with, you know, because there are elements I can take out of what would have been part of book three and part of book four and make them their own book later on. So that's totally fine. Uh, when when the deal came, the deal offer came in yesterday, uh, my editor was actually afraid to ask my agent to have her ask me if that was okay to do it as a trilogy. I'm like, yeah, of course. That's the thing. We're, we're Weird as it sounds, writers are the gods of their own universe. They can bend reality to their will. So it was no problem for me to, to swap it into a trilogy. Uh, and it's actually somewhat exciting because it's a new creative challenge to, to, to wrap up certain storylines and decide which ones do not need to be wrapped up in the trilogy that can be left hanging for future exploration and characters. And that's going to be fun because now that I'm, as I'm listening to uh, the book again, I'm making notes on some things that I want to follow up in book three and what, things that I want to maybe leave for either a standalone or maybe another trilogy. Like Joe Abercrombie does things in trilogies. He's one of my favorite current fantasy writers. And I can see the point of that because you want that big sprawling story, but there is something about closure. You know, a storyline ends and then the characters move on carrying the scars and the memories of what they've been through, which makes them slightly different characters in the next trilogy. And I'm looking forward to that sort of process. So, yeah. Well, what else we got? We've got time for more questions. Yeah. Yes. All kinds of poetry. Uh, my bias is the, the, either the romantics, imagists, or Pirapulites from the 19th or early 20th century, but I read all over the place. And uh, I've even written forwards for a couple of books of poetry recently for, you know, for writer friends. Unfortunately, this country does not value poetry as much as some other countries do, which is why most poetry is self-published, because the market just doesn't support it. I don't understand this, because people will listen to, to you know, their favorite music, whether it be country, rap, you know, whatever it's going to be. That's poetry, you know. So why is poetry not as, as respected here? I, I, I just don't get it. But I read across the board. I read all sorts of stuff. Um, and also, I, I buy books of, po of lyrics and read them as poetry. Like my, two of my favorite uh, uh, writers, singer-songwriters, one is dead, one is still alive, Tom Waits and Leonard Cohen. I love their stuff, but their stuff can be read as poetry. And, and I've done, read it aloud, in fact. We did a, at this writer's center I, I used to run back in Pennsylvania, we did a, 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 a poetry night. And um, I read some Tom Waits poem, uh, songs as poetry, and they read beautifully that way. But I've read spoken word. My, my son does spoken word. Um, I've read, uh, in fact, some of his spoken word was in my V-Wars books. He did vampire poetry. Um, yeah, vampire rap, which actually is, is what he did. It's really cool. Um, yeah, and I've, I've read, I, I read all over the place. And any, if anyone ever has suggestions for, for poet, poets for me to read, I always welcome those suggestions. So you, you can tell me after the signing or, or, or message me online because if that poet has a book out, I'm going to grab it. So, but yeah, I love poetry. Uh, I, I can't even imagine sitting down to write without having read some poetry first. Like right now I'm working through uh, um, one of Charles Bukowski's book of very downbeat poetry. I mean, I kind of hate the guy, but he poses interesting images and almost challenges you to to despise him for them, and I do, um, but the, but the images are really great. So yeah, I'm doing some of that. And there's a, a book of urban poetry I just got. I can't remember the title of it, but it's uh, written in the the meter scheme, uh, the rhyme scheme of um, kind of like late 1980s, early early 1990s rap, 
but it's but it's but they go a little further into alternate meanings. And I'm trying to remember what the name of the book is. I just got it recently. So love love poetry. So great question. What else you got? Yes. Oh man, there's so many. Um, uh, there's so many characters that I love. I mean, I'm a big fan of many of the characters in, in Kagan. Uh, I was a huge fan of a lot of the characters in Ink, although there is one role that I specifically love to play in Ink. Um, the short stories, again, you know, they're, they're great fun. I mean, and then, you know, there's my friends, you know, the. the Job and Bunny and Joe and, you know, all of it. I mean, those, those are like hooking up with old friends that I haven't seen in a long time. When I sit down to read them again. I wouldn't be able to just pick one or two. There's something that I love about every one of them. Truly. Cool. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Owen Minor. Owen Minor. He's, he's the most vile and reprehensible villain I've ever created, and he wants to play it. He's aspiring to that. Yes, please. Yeah, he is dark side. So, right. yeah. And if guys, if you haven't seen the, the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League, he's the bad guy's boss. He's dark side. Only the only the, the extended cut, not in the uh, the ethical release. Uh, well, Mr. Whedon had some opinions about how the film should be. Yeah, well, we don't like Justice League anymore. We so like anyway. we like Zack Snyder. Uh, yeah. Okay. Other question. Yes. This is, well, uh, okay, it, this was my 44th novel to write. I, my 45th was the sequel to this. Um, and I have 10 sold that I haven't yet written. But I've also done um, 18 short story collections, 20, 20 anthologies as editor, and a um, whole slew of nonfiction books. So I, I don't and, and graphic novels. So I've actually my agent and I were talking about this on the phone yesterday. We couldn't remember how many books we've done together. Uh, we it's north of a hundred, but we don't know where. You know, get, with all those different types of books. So what's the motive for the question? Oh yeah. Oh, sure. Um, here's one of the one of the things that was in um, uh, my first three novels: Ghost Road Blues, Dead Man's Song, Bad Man Rise, and Horror Trilogy called the Pine Deep Trilogy. Uh, when I wrote it, the first book took me three and a half years to write. So, because it took me a long time to write it, I would, as I'm writing this long book, thinking, "Well, it's been a long time since I mentioned this character. I should probably introduce them again and describe them again." Forgetting that, even though it took me three and a half years to write, it's going to take somebody three or four days to read it. They're not going to forget. I, I would love to go back and make those changes. Um, and also, there is a glaring, glaring technical error in the first book that still haunts me. Um, when I was writing the book, I, I had um, a character, a crime scene photographer taking photos, right? And um, when I was doing revisions on it, I had just gotten my first digital camera. So I figured that's the, that's the new wave of, of photography. So I gave him a digital camera. I had checked with a local friend of mine, a friend of mine who was a, um, the chief of local police department. And yes, they were switching to digital cameras. So how to do that. But I forgot to take out the, the reference later on when he runs out of film. So I think everyone who's ever owned a camera has contacted me to tell me that digital cameras don't run out of film. And if, you know, I could have gotten away with it if it said the memory chip had gotten full. But no, he ran out of film. Um, and I, I get uh, I get fried for that one still. So I, yeah, I'd like to change that, but they're not going to let me do it. Um, and in fact, uh, that publisher keeps reissuing those books. Um, their, the tenth anniversary edition came out uh, six years ago, um, and now we just sold a book call, called um, "Past Midnight: Tales of Pine Deep," which are short stories set in and around that world, which will be out next year. And I said, "Well, does that mean you're, I'm going to get a chance to go back and make those edit cuts?" Just nah. So I just live with the abuse I get from photographers. Turns out there are a lot of photographers these days, especially now that every phone is its own camera. Everyone is a photographer with an opinion. Because nobody runs out of film. No, nobody runs out of film. And all of those photographers can kiss my ass. 
Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. What do you got? Yes. All right, so, so Melissa, had, had, from uh, who's watching live, has asked that if I write more Joe Ledger books, not to kill the character of Ghost off. Um, there are very few characters in the Joe Ledger series, as dedicated readers have found out, that are safe. Ghost is safe. I, I will do a lot of harm to a lot of characters. I do not want to take uh, what would come at me if I killed that oh, dog off. Pitchforks. Man. Yeah, it, it would, I mean, yeah. literally villagers, pitchforks, and, and, and yeah. torches. Um, he may retire at some point, but since the chronology of Joe is not normal, like uh, by the time the 15th book comes, comes out, it'll be 17 years since I wrote the first one. But it's it's really kind of like six years for Joe. So Ghost, since he was a kind of a just an older puppy when he got him, is, um, is, still, is still in the game. And in fact, I had a, a friend of mine who's a vet. Actually, James Rollins, the uh, the author James Rollins, uh, suggested that I come up with some chemical formula, some weird science, <clears throat> Ronald, um, th that that would, <laughs> would help ghosts live a little longer. Even though bigger dogs usually have a shorter lifespan than, say, little dogs like my my Rosie back there. Say there, that's that's why I got these guys because it it makes me look smart, uh, which really helps. Um, but no, go, goes to safe. Now, uh, in the next book, the one I'm about to write, Cave 13, um, I pick up on something I referred to a while ago where Ghost and the dog Banshee, which was given to uh, Cersei, uh, Church's daughter, um, had puppies. But we never talk about what happens to those puppies. One of those puppies now, uh, an, you know, an adult dog, is going to factor into the story, and one of the characters will have that. Um, also in that book, by the way, uh, there are a lot of fans of the character Toys, who was not in the original book. Um, Sebastian Galt had no partner, no no assistant. My editor had asked me to give my, my villain someone to talk to. And um, I created the character of Toys, and he became one of the most popular characters in the series. If you read Relentless, the newest Joe Ledger book, you know that he has a pretty solid part in that. In the next book, he gets his own team, The Wild Hunt. And... Um, Think of the Dirty Dozen run by toys. <laughs> That's going to be weird and fun to write. Yeah, yeah. And they're not going to be friends, Joe. Yeah. Well, that, 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 that's, that's going to go south pretty quickly, and I can't wait to write it. So we have time for one more question. Yes. Yes, sir. Jazz hands. Jazz hands. Okay. Yeah, that's the that's, uh, character. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Um, I love that character. And I would very much like to have the voice of that in the film, please. Um, yeah. Audio book of the year last year, by the way. Audio book of the year. It's my first Thank you. Yeah, that was my, that was my first audio award. Um, I've been nominated before, but uh, yeah, Project and Mary won Best Sci Fi and uh, Audio Book of the Year. So now I have to run the trophies in my house up in the my audio book in Mary friends. Which is, yeah, which is weird, because in Pasadena, a lot of audiobook readers have seem to have clustered there. I'm not sure what that's about. There's a few of us over there. We think it might be safe. Um, yeah, I, I love that. I love that book. It was so much fun. That was one of those, like Jonathan's, like Peter's books, where, you know, I get up and I'm like, sweet, let's go back and find out what happened today, you know. And I, I really do have to, like, stop myself from recording because it starts getting ragged. Uh, but I'm just having such fun reading the book. It was just devouring. Was, that was certainly one of them. Um, and I loved it very well. So. <laughs> Let's make that one. Yeah. Oh, cool. I didn't even know that. Nice. <laughs> That's my bum. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. He's... There's also a Facebook page called Fifty Shades of Red, yes, which I was afraid to go to at first because there's certain things I'm photos of you I don't it. want to see. Yeah. You know. But um, no, it, it's it's a fun it's a fun page. You're dragging old pictures of me out on the internet like for promos. Well, you know. Yeah. 
It was only once, and I was high. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, like the photo that they used to promote this thing. It's like I was a larva then. Yeah, well, know, but, yeah. Better skin. I, I have friends who are using their same author headshot for like 30 years in a row. You know. <laughs> it's a daguerreotype. Yeah. The, um, the author never ages. Yeah. So. Um, the leaflet that Dory read. <laughs> it sounds like it should be a short story. I'll, I'll write it, you read it. Uh, I'll write it, you read it. All right. Oh, by the way, he actually wrote a short story that was in a vignette that was in um, the latest Joe Lynch short story collection, Joe Lynch's Secret Missions, Church's Day Off which was so much fun to, to read and so much fun to listen to you read. It was weird. The story of that is I, I just had this thought and I, I floated it to him and he said, great, write it. And I was like, but I don't write. I missed it. Um, and then one day I sat down and it just kind of like, blah, it just all sort of came out. And I sent it to him. I was like, just, just please be nice is all I ask. Be honest, but please be nice. And he's like, put that in the book. I was yeah. Like, Huh. Wait. Um, and he's writing. A, is we writing another one? Church visiting church Aunt church Sally, Sally in the nursing home after yes. what happened to her in deep silence. Yes. And uh, that's going to be. I can't wait to read. That. I got a feeling I'm going to cry buckets. From he's that making one. me a writer. Well, why not? I think you got you got the chops, boy. If the acting thing doesn't work out for you, you know. Okay. Well, <laughs> the only condition is you have to marry. <laughs> that would be weird, but fun. I know, right? Yeah. So, so now I feel like that somehow we got to make that happen. Is there a copy of Secret Mission around here someplace? <laughs> I want to That would be funny. Um, um, anyway, we, we got to wrap. Um, thank you guys for coming out. Thanks to everyone who's watching online. Uh, Kagan the Damned. Get dark, get weird, get the book. So thanks. And thank you, Ray. Thank you, my friend. Always, Always a, pleasure. a pleasure. Thank you. All righty. This one's for sale, too. I just grabbed it off the shelf to read. From, so there's a handy copy. And of course, uh, I will be happy to sign books, uh, the ones you bought here, and if some of you bought, brought some from home, happy to sign those as well. Um, and I guess Rob is going to be the master of the line. 